<laughs> Good morning. When your printer quits working at work or working at home, how's that? It's not a rock concert, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you print at church and then you get to talking and doing other things and you forget that your page is sitting on the printer and come hopping in with it. Well, we're so glad that you're all with us today. Those of you that are online, welcome. We would ask that you just give us a shout out in the comments, say hi or good morning or what have you. Let us know that you're with us. We've got a few announcements this morning. First off, we have our Wednesday Bible study this Wednesday at seven o'clock. Uh, join us for a, a time of study. And then certainly after that, we have a time of prayer. And that prayer list is ever growing, ever shrinking ever growing, ever shrinking. It grows when there's a need and it shrinks when God shows up. And we thank God for that. So join us for that time. Again, that's 7 o'clock right here. But we're going to be moving into a new study soon. And that new study is called The Engagement Project. Um, this is a, uh, a new study that just came out that we've been waiting for. We've been watching De uh, Del Tacca's website now for what, over a year mark? just waiting for this to, to come out, and it finally has come out. And this study is going to help us to truly know him in a more, in a deeper way. Um, and then it's going to help us understand who we truly are, and why we are still here, and what God has asked us to do. And I know that this has prompted uh, God to speak to Mark this past week or two, and that's where our sermon today comes from. So I won't, I'm going to leave it right there for now. Um, next up after that, we'll have our next men's breakfast on Saturday, May 4th at 9 a.m. If you know, sorry, ladies, but it's for the guys. But if you know a guy that would benefit from coming and joining with us for time of devotion, some time of, it's very Christian, uh, churchy word, but fellowship. It's just time to be together and to converse and to get to know each other better. So we invite uh, the and men for this. And, and, and eat, yeah, eat, eat, eat biscuits and gravy. Uh, let's get to the important well, stuff. Well, I'm surprised <laughs> Denny brought that up because he likes to take home the leftovers and the more biscuits and gravy that gets eaten, and the less you get. Two weeks in, I'm still eating it every morning. Oh, okay. So we're <laughs> we the, just good care of it. The <laughs> following Saturday after that, the 11th, we'll have our May races. So. Uh, May 11th at 9.30, racing uh, registration starts, and then racing, and we say 10 o'clock, but we have grace here, and so if we're still setting up, we might take a little bit longer than that, but if you'd like more information about that, go out to orangetrackracing.org. Then the following weekend, let's just, we're going to be real busy. We're going to be showing uh, Grace Street Cinema because we, that is our movie wing of our ministry. We'll be showing the movie Son of God. Uh, this movie was released back in 2014, so 10 years ago. Um, and it's an epic biblical film directed by Christopher Spencer and produced by Mark Burnett and Roma Downey, who you would remember from Touched by an Angel. Um, she plays Mary, and it's a, just a neat telling of, the, or the retelling of life the life of Jesus, and it's actually an adaptation of a 10-hour miniseries that was called The Bible that was uh, aired in 2013 on the History Channel. Uh, so it just kind of puts it all into a, I think it's two hours and 18 minutes long. So it is a little longer, but uh, it is a, a great movie uh, to watch. So we look forward to so showing you So do we get birthday cake because it's your birthday day? We could probably do something about that. <laughs> or I might just, you know, hide. <laughs> For those of you that are worshiping with us online, the link will be going up uh, momentarily with the link to our worship music. Um, as, you, as you may have noticed uh, over the last month or so, we've started putting the announcement reel in there as well so you can see the announcements then the music, and then certainly we will also have the trailers for both the engagement, pro or, yeah, the engagement Project as well as the movie Son of God is included in that 
playlist link, so uh, you can go out and watch those. We will get you will get to see it if you're here after we sing today. So uh, we thank you for that. Now, now is the time where we need to just calm ourselves, calm our spirits. I think of uh, Psalm forty six ten. Be still and know that I'm God. Taking the time to just calm ourselves and realize that God is in control and God's got this. And as you prepare your hearts and you pray, prepare your minds for this morning's message, pray with me. Father God, we just thank you for the day that you've given us. Father, it is a gorgeous day outside. We can see with the leaves coming out on the trees and the flowers uh, coming up in the, the flower beds and even something as simple as what we call a weed, but those dandelions, Father, that is a sign of spring, a sign of renewal. And we thank you. Father, as we prepare to hear the word that you've given to Mark this morning, we just thank you for that. We thank you that you are always speaking and you are always guiding and you are always directing us, Father. Help us to calm our minds, calm our hearts, put everything else aside and hear you speak this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and this is from the classic edition of the Amplified Bible. But you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. Now, if you grew up in the church and you were small and you heard this verse and you heard the verses about the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples, how many of you wondered if you were going to see flames on somebody's head? I did. And that's an outward expression in that time of what the Holy Spirit looked like when it came down. Now, this verse is, there's a lot packed into this verse. This verse is, basically, it's the theme of Acts. Beginning with the Spirit's empowering of the witnesses to Jesus. See, the Holy Spirit brings us effectiveness and witness in ministry, and victory over sin, victory over Satan, and gifts for ministry. This power that believers get and receive from the Holy Spirit includes courage and boldness, confidence, insight, ability, and authority. I have no problem going out and when we have a meal at a restaurant or out somewhere, I will, we will pray. Doesn't matter where it is. But praying other places, that hasn't always come as easily. Yesterday I had we had this divine appointment. We had gone to a store and there was somebody that was uh, basically doing a demonstration of a product. And we were interested in this product and did ultimately end up buying it, but that had nothing to do with the interaction that we had. And I believe it was with Mike. His name was Mike. Mike's from Boston. Works for a company called Infinity. Mike had this really cool uh, leather strap on his wrist with a cross. And so as we got to talking to him, he just organically started speaking about his faith and how when he turned to God back in 99, that God just took away the, his need for alcohol and all these other things, and he, he changed him. And this whole time, I hear, I'm hearing the words that he's saying, and I'm just beaming inside from it, and then God says, pray for him. And not just as you walk away. So, Diane and I put our arms around him, and we prayed over him. This is the this boldness and this confidence and this courage that the Holy Spirit will give to you. It's also what the disciples and we need to use our gifts to fulfill our mission. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, you can experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your life as well. This verse also talks about the ever-widening circle. See, it talks about my witness in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. 
it just tells us what the Old Testament said, that God's people weren't just a country club meant to just have it amongst themselves. They were, t they were the start. And Jesus showed that with his disciples and then sent them out. And that's what he is doing with us. To encompass every person in the world. God knows who that is. And when that last person is touched, that last person is spoken to, that last person has accepted him, we will have finished our mission. It may be a family member, a friend, a co-worker, or someone you've never met or may never meet, or someone who lives in the distant future. But it's our job to go out and use our gifts to expand God's ever-widening circle with his message of love. Hence the message that Mark has given this morning. Are you engaged? Father God, we bring up Pastor Mark right now, Father, and we thank you for the message again that you have given him today. Father, just be with us, open us up to hear, open us up to be willing to not only hear the message, but to participate and be engaged. As James says, faith without works is it. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. All bright, sunny faces out here, bright, sunny skies out here. It's going to be a great day, right? Absolutely. So I'm going to ask a big favor if you would turn back to the slide on the call to worship um, that we had on here this morning. Maybe. Hello. Hello. Can you turn back to the call to worship? So the call to worship is actually a call to action. It's to shake the people up from where they were before. And that's why I wanted to use this one here with the amplified version. Um, because when you are enabled by the Holy Spirit, when you have that relationship with God and with the Holy Spirit, you are enabled, you are given the ability, you're given efficiency, you're given might. It's to move you out, it's a call to action when that Holy Spirit comes upon you. But notice what he said next in here. My witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. Okay, that's the Jewish people. That's the Jewish crowd. What's the next place he wants? <coughs> Samaria. The absolute enemies of those Jewish people. So he says, I'm not going to, this isn't going to be, as Terry put it, a country club. We want to go out and we want to reach out to our enemies as well because they need the good news just as much as you do. And then he says, to the very ends of the earth, the bounds of the earth. In other words, there's no boundaries that I don't want this message to cross. And it was a call to action for not only the disciples, but all those who they were discipling. And so it was a complete change of mindset from what they had been told for thousands of years because the Jewish people were to only associate with the Jewish people. And now he says, oh, no, 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 go out to everyone. And I could go on all the way back to when, you know, the sheet was brought down from heaven and they were given that message of go to everyone, not just the ones. So anything that I've made clean, you were able to go out and speak. And that, told, that took down the boundaries then between the Jewish people and the Sumerians, all of the Gentiles, all to the ends of the earth. And so this has a lot more being said in it than what you might realize. But it was a call out of their comfort zone for the Jewish people and saying, okay, if you're going to be my disciples and I'm going to enable you, if you're going to believe in me, and you are going to be my disciples out here, you got to automatically get out of that comfort zone and go out and do what I ask you to do. I'm glad that wasn't turned on. But to go out and do what I have asked you to do. So the theme of the message this morning is, are you engaged? Are you engaged? Now, I'm not talking about what your love life is, is like out here at all. 
I'm asking you about your relationship status. So are you engaged? Are you in a committed relationship? When couples become engaged, they're telling those around them that they, they have made a commitment to the, the relationship and one that is meant to last a lifetime. And most of the time when we think about that, if you're engaged, is of course, the first thing pops into mind is, ooh, I got this neat engagement. I got this rock that I've got on my finger, which is an outward sign to everybody else that say, hey, you know, I'm taken. I'm in a committed relationship. I'm in a committed relationship. Sound familiar? Well, engagement is a mutual relationship that's built on trust, love, and belief that they are who they say they are and that they will do what they said they will do. Any of that sound familiar? We've been talking about that quite a bit around the Easter season, throughout the entire Lenten season, that Jesus was who he said he was and he was going to do what he said he was going to do. And he fulfilled it all through the cross. And so when you're in a committed relationship, you have to have that, that trust bond, that love and the belief that they are who they say they are and that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. So in our relationships, we have to take a lot of this on faith. Let's face it, we don't know everything else about that other person. Sure, you can go ahead and do a background check on them if you wish. But doesn't that really negate that first part of that trust relationship that you're supposed to have to begin with? Yeah. So you're, if, you, if you go and do that, you're saying, well, I don't really trust you. Um, and so I want to know more before I get into a relationship with you. So it kind of negates that trust factor that they're asking you to trust that they are who they say they are and they're going to do what they say they can do. So when Jesus handpicked the disciples, see, compared to us right now, he had a real advantage. Simply put, he was God. So he knew their hearts. He knew their beliefs. He knew that they could be trusted to carry out the mission that he was going to ask them to do. But see, still at that same time, each one of those people on the screen, they had free will, just like you and I have free will. They had to make a choice and they had to choose, and they had to understand that they were entering into a trust relationship that Jesus was who he said he was, and he was going to do what he said he was going to do. And in doing so, what happened with them? What happened with them? Well, it was life-changing. In that, they inherited ability. They inherited might be able to go out and, and do what they needed to do. Um, were they 100% on board from the very beginning? Not quite. I mean, but let's fix, face it. They had Jesus in their midst, so they had an advantage over us there. Somewhat. Well, obviously, no one would blindly go into a relationship. They would spend some time getting to know the other person first, right? And see, that's what Jesus is calling us to do. I mean, when I got into a relationship with Lori, she kept telling me, soon, soon, soon. And I really grew to despise that word. Well, after 10 years, she finally said, okay. I think I wore her down. So, just kidding. I love you now. Uh, but my point here is we usually don't jump right in and go. It takes some time to get to know the processes, to get to know the people, to get to know what this relationship is all about. And so we need time to learn some things as well. First, one of the things that I want to talk about today is how to disciple others and or how to be a disciple yourself. See, when we're called and we we're called into a relationship with Jesus, we're called to become a disciple. And a disciple, for the most part, is simply being a student of the teacher. So as you notice, as we were going through the chosen in there, and they were talking about Jesus as the rabbi, well, each one of the rabbis usually had a following underneath him, which were his disciples, and that's where that comes from. They are learning the process to go out on their own. 
and preach and teach the good news. So we had a discipleship program at another church that we attended years ago, and it was an awakening program. It was a call to action. It was a call to be engaged, and not with each other, but to be engaged as a disciple of Christ. And so it was a opportunity for us to, uh, to grow in our faith to establish a good foundation of our faith. And so when Pastor Terry and I started this church up, one of the first things we did for the first year is we taught foundational Bible, Bible studies and everything to give us the foundation to become a disciple so that we could move forward with the rest of the church. So just as we had back then, we adopted the, the tenets of the program that we used in the disciple program and those were to know, to grow, and to go. Yeah, your mouth and the words. And it was based on the same thing that the disciples went through when they started out. Okay? So they needed to be able to know what Jesus was all about so they could grow in their faith so that they could then go and disciple others, be a leader for others to follow in the faith. Now, we didn't have the advantage of performing signs and wonders like Jesus did, but, and let's face it, that would be enough to motivate anybody and convince even the most hardened skeptic that you are who you say you are and you can do what you say you can do. But what we did do is we set up a program of study to learn more about why we should follow Jesus ourselves. Because we have to know why we should do this to start with. Because you won't take ownership of it until you know why. So there's got to be a why factor behind that. And so one of the things that I did was I taught a study on what is called the journey of a disciple. And it was great because it was a virtual tour of the Holy Land as we followed the path of Jesus and the disciples. And we got to walk a mile in their shoes, so to speak. Uh, so what it did was we had a series of teachings that, that this missionary couple made it their life's work to do as they went over to the Holy Land. And then they followed scripturally in each one of the places. And we went to Capernaum and we went to Ephesus and we went to Thessalonica and, and we followed the journey of the disciples through the area. And it was the why factor. Why did they have to go? Why did they talk to these people? Now, we did the, the Bible study here a couple of years ago of, you know, the cultural references. Why did we talk? Why did they say these things? Why did they talk to these people? How did it work? And where was Jesus in all of this? And so we walked through the entire Bible through that study. And it was contextual, meaning why was he there? What did they do? Who did they talk to? Who, where, what, why? And we also talked about when. So we answered all those questions, and in order to do that, that was to give us the ability then to be able to speak intelligently when we went to disciple others. So we learned more about the hows and whys and what's of being a disciple really meant. So we built the no factor. The no factor. Then we undertook Bible studies to help build our faith and our knowledge of Jesus, why he came, and what he was doing on his time here on earth. And more knowing of Jesus and his mission that we could do through all of these things, we were able to grow in that knowledge. And as we grew in the knowledge, then our relationship with Christ grew at the same time. Then we were commissioned to go and make disciples of other people. Well, through this program, we grew our congregation by inviting others to join with us, number one. So we went out, as they said, go out into, into Jerusalem and then out into all Judea, kind of start, start local and then work out, and then into Samaria and to the bounds of the earth. That's what we're told to do in Acts. Well, through this program, we started out inviting people to come to church who may not have gone to church for a long time, may have been burnt out by the church, may have had a bad experience somewhere else, and say, hey, come and see, we're different. 
So if you notice one of the things, we have it right on our door over there, come and see. And the reason why is we're not like a lot of the other churches out there. By design, we're not like them. Well, some of the other programs we started is they started up the Walk to Emmaus uh, here in Cedar Rapids, and that later grew into six other communities throughout the Midwest. I'm talking Minneapolis, mm -hmm. Omaha, all over the place. And that grew thousands and thousands of disciples through, I think at the last count, there was over 4,800 people who had gone through the Cedar Rapids Walk to Emmaus alone. And it's an enhancement program, a discipling program that was started up to do exactly this, to build the knowledge, to grow in your relationship with God, and then to go out and make disciples of others. And through the discipling program then, we actually started up another church in town. We helped it grow as well. God anointed us to go on that journey, and as we went, our faith grew in response to how we were missioned to go and do for God. So what does all this have to do with being engaged, right? We're all thinking of the rocks and the fingers. Well, it's simply this. Uh, it is a call to action in our faith journey. It's a call to action in our faith journey. Webster says, engage means to join or commit to a cause. And engagement then, which is the verb form of the word, puts it into action. Engagement means putting that commitment into action. So to be engaged means you're going to commit to that cause. If you're going to have and be engaged as a disciple of Christ, you have to commit to having a relationship with Christ. And in order to do that, you need to be involved in studies. You need to be involved in church. This is the family of God. We are called to be a family of God. If you're not involved and you're just going through the motions, then you're not engaged. You're not committed to the cause. And engagement then means we have to take that commitment and we have to put it into action. So if we think in terms of our faith, it becomes very, very clear on who we are, what we're supposed to be doing, and what we're called to do by Christ. James 2, 14 through 17 says, What is it good, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? has no deeds. Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you goes and tells him, hey, go in peace, stay warm and well fed, but doesn't help provide for those physical needs, what good is that? What good is that? So to faith by itself, if it doesn't result in action, is dead. If you don't put your faith in action, then you won't be producing the good deeds that come as a result of your faith. Just going out and saying, I volunteer here and I volunteer here and I volunteer here isn't good enough. What it means is you have to have the faith back behind it. Put that faith in action then to step out and do the good deeds that God wants you to do. James goes on in verse 26 then to say, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also, James 2.26. So faith without works is a dead faith because the lack of works reveals an unchanged life or a spiritually dead heart. You can go through the motions all day long, but unless you're engaged, unless you're engaged in that relationship with Christ, then it's a dead spirit. It's a dead heart. There's many verses that talk about true saving faith. And the, the whole New Testament is replete with all kinds of different verses. Because it is so important to have a true saving faith. Because that then will result in a transformed life. If you go through the motions, your life will never be transformed. But if you have a true saving faith, that basis behind it, that foundational faith behind it, then you will have a transformed life. And that faith is demonstrated then by the works we do. It's a byproduct of the faith that we have. 
It's not how many good works can you do? You go out and do good works all day long. It'll never get you into the kingdom of God. Never. But if that is based on a foundational of faith, why you're doing it, who are you doing it for, that purposefulness will then result in a transformed life. So I've spoken many times about our, our belief system and its effect on our lives. And I know we've gone through this many, many times, but our belief system is so important to us to have eternal life. Because unless we've got a good faith system in place and we act upon that faith system, that determines what our character is. That determines what other people see us as. We can either be seen as a bunch of hypocrites, and I saw a, a post uh, from someone else today about someone who claims to be a Christian, but their actions speak completely different. Why are their actions speaking completely different? Because see, our faith determines what our actions are gonna be. By the words of our mouth, we can say we're a Christian, but by our actions, if they don't support it, then your faith is dead, and you're spiritually, you have a dead heart. So that's what I'm talking about today. How we live reveals what we believe and whether the faith that we profess has a living faith or not, or whether the faith is simply having a spiritually dead heart. See, some of them have fallen asleep when it comes to their faith. Yes, they attend church. Yes, they attend, attend church functions. But unless they put their faith in action, they're simply going through the motions. If you think back in your life when I talked about this, I'm sure someone popped in your head, right? All of us have gone through our church lives or our lives, and we see someone who goes through the motions. They go to church, but they have no relationship with Jesus. They go through church because, as a kid, their parents brought them to church, so it became habit. It just was a habit. It was a rite or a ritual that they went through. Sundays you go to church. Why? Well, that's what you do. No. You go to church because you have a relationship, not just with Jesus, but with all of those around us in here. I talk about that all the time, that unless you have that engagement, with the body of Christ, you're missing out. You're missing out on them being able to bless you when you're having struggles. They can take those struggles upon them. They can intercede in prayer for you. They can lift you up to God. But at the same token, you're also afforded that same blessing, that same ability to put your faith in action and to pray for them, to edify them, to lift them up out of the problems and out of the things they're facing in life each and every day. Jesus puts you in their life to give them that blessing. Don't rob them of that blessing. Don't rob yourself of the blessing by not being in the body of Christ. Because that is the church. That's what the church is all about. Ooh. All right. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully... When I talk about people who just go through the motions, it's not you, right? But even if it was, now is the time, today is the day to become engaged. Put your faith in action. Let me see a show of hands here of anyone who knows someone who could use a spiritual awakening. Okay? Now keep your hands up if that person is you. Yeah. Okay. All right. If you fail to see that you yourself is the person who needs that spiritual awakening, you're kidding yourself. You're going through the action. Notice my hand stood up. It was stayed up. And the reason for that is, no matter where you are in your walk of faith, you need to have that awakened faith within you, living in your heart. You have to have Christ alive in your life. And if you don't, you're simply going through the motions. We always need a spiritual uplifting, no matter where we are in our walk with Christ. No matter where we are. So everyone's hand should have stayed up that entire time. Because we all need it. Sometimes we don't want to admit it to ourselves. But we do. I pastor a church. I still need it. 
I have to get fed just like you have to be fed. I get fed a lot of times in my message because I write these messages for me as as much for you. And that's the way it is. God talks to me that way. We all can use a spiritual awakening. We all can use engagement. We all can use putting our faith in action. So, we will be starting a new study from Dr. Del Tackett called The Engagement Project. And that's why I chose this for the title of the message today. And this is a different study. We kind of talked about this on Wednesday night, uh, last Wednesday. But this is a way that we can put our faith in action to give it a boost, to help us grow spiritually. Which I've talked about in my previous message that I had in the sermon it is the relationship that we have with God in Jesus Christ that makes the difference in our life, whether we have a spiritually faith-saving, transformed life or not. It's relationship-bound. If we don't know God, if we don't know Jesus, then we don't have a transformed life. Bottom line. So the difference with this study that sets it apart from every other study that we've ever done is we're going to see a ser series of videos. And then instead of having Mark or Terry stand up here and teach, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss what you saw and what spoke to you in these videos. Because, see, that's engaging you to give out what someone else in the group may need to be hearing at that point in time. You don't need just to hear it from me or from Terry. So it is to engage us in the process of becoming engaged in the project whatsoever. And so it's a way to give us that boost, to help us grow spiritually. And Matthew 18 through 20 tells us about the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. And Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So no matter where we are in our process, no matter where we are in our walk with God, he's right there with us sometimes carrying us, as that foot, Footprints poem says. Because when we're at our lowest and we just can't seem to go on anymore, then we have to fall on our knees, submit ourselves, humble ourselves to Jesus. He will pick us up and carry us to where we need to be. That's that relationship I'm talking about. If we don't have that spirit-filled relationship with the living Christ in our hearts, through the Holy Spirit, we're going through the motions. We're going through the motions. So in this passage, Jesus is giving the disciples their marching orders, so to speak, if you want to. The blending of the Gospels tells us a better picture of this, and, and I love that little book that the Chosen put out. So they have a blended of all the Gospels come together so you can understand it better. Gives us a lot better picture of what Jesus wants. And first is to follow Jesus. Second is to wait for that Holy Spirit power to come upon us. And three is to go and tell others. Matthew goes on and, and, uh, in his writings on Jesus, and Jesus tells them where they're supposed to go and how they're supposed to go out. And in Luke, then, he tells them this, and he said to them, Thus it is written, thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all of the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, the Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city, not tarry, tarry, stay around the city, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued, endowed, I, I spelled that wrong, endowed with the power from on high. So what he said is, 
that they were supposed to tarry or stay there until the Spirit comes upon them. That's that empowerment. That's that ability that we talked about when we first started everything off today. We need to wait for that Spirit of God to be upon us because that's what guides and directs us to do God's will in our life. If we go out on our own, we're simply following ourselves instead of following God. So, the Spirit comes upon them. Then in Matthew it says, go, which is the opposite of stay. So, in Luke it said, Jesus told them to stay for a while, stay for a while, until the Spirit comes upon you. Then, go, as it says in Matthew, and they stayed in Jerusalem, as initially commanded to do, waiting for the Holy Spirit. But then what happens? Once the Holy Spirit sh shows up, well, they were pretty comfortable where they were, so they continued to stay. They stayed in Jerusalem. It isn't until a wave of persecution sweeps through the church in Jerusalem that Jesus' followers then scatter out. That's when they went. That's when they said go. Because they weren't listening to that still small voice, that spirit of God living within them that said, hey, stick around here, but don't get too comfortable. You need to go and do what I ask you to do. So finally, this forces them to go as Jesus instructed, but where? Now we find in Luke that, and in Matthew, it doesn't record where they're supposed to go other than everywhere. He says, go into all the world and make the disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Anyway, but, but Luke, however, gives us more details. In the beginning of his writing in the book of Acts, which we have for a call to worship, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, there Jesus says, under the power of the Holy Spirit, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he wants his followers, his disciples, you and I, to tell others about him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the rest of the world. To everyone. Again, notice here that being filled with the Holy Spirit precedes us going out. We have to know we have to grow, and then we have to go. The relationship must be built so the Spirit has a place to dwell. Now, this is Mark's interpretation. Me, not the other Mark. But from these four locations, we can interpret then the four areas of ministry. Jerusalem, which is where we live. That's where the disciples live. Judea, which is our own group of people. That's where the Jewish community lives. Samaria represents the other people who live nearby, and the end of the earth means, hey, everybody needs to hear this message. And so we've got pretty succinct marching orders if we follow the Spirit, and it leads us to understand what is written there. See, it was very simple terms written in Acts 1.8, but unless we understand what it means... We are to reach the people in our own community. Then we are supposed to go in those of our like people, our people or our group of people. Then we're supposed to go to Samaria. Ooh, Samaria. Now, we all know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? The Samaritans were the enemies, sworn enemies of the Jewish people. Unto death, a lot of times. So he's telling them, hey, I want you to go to your absolute enemies out here and preach the good news. To do so, I've empowered you with the Holy Spirit. And remember what he said at the very end of that verse in Matthew. That lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. You're not going alone. You don't have to do this by yourselves. I will be with you always. So, in order to make disciples of all the nations, that means they need to accept Jesus, then disciple them, meaning learning, study, building the relationship, which is what a disciple does. And then what happens? It's phase two of the discipleship program, and that is the training or the teaching. And that teaching phase may be the second thing that you go through, but see, it never ends. 
it never ends. That teaching phase goes for the rest of time. We never stop learning. We never stop learning. So teaching is the long-term effort of making disciples. Because see, as God's word tells us, as we grow in our relationship to God, as we study his word more, he reveals more of his secrets to us. His word tells us that. So it is a lifelong undertaking to go through that study and the teaching. Grow and then go. There are other aspects of teaching which Jesus just doesn't detail in that passage. But we can infer this from his actions as we read about it in the Bible. But see, we won't know about any of those things unless we actually go and do <coughs> and read and study and participate. Participate. Ooh, that's a big word. <laughs> participate. But we need one other step in between, and that's called baptism. Being born of the water and the spirit, if we remember what Jesus told Nicodemus, is that he needed to be born again of the water and the spirit in order in, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the same goes for all the rest. It tells us over and over and over and over again that baptism with the water and the spirit is necessary. In the Gospel of Mark, he tells a more complete story of the Great Commission. Mark says in 16, 15, and 18, he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, in my post this morning, I, I was talking about it. I asked if everyone was engaged. I posted that on Facebook this morning. And in that post, I said, understand that the rapture is only for believers. And we don't know the day or time that the rapture is going to occur because, see, there's nothing that has to precede that. No signs, no wonders, nothing. When the rapture happens, the rapture happens. It could happen in two minutes. We don't know. We don't know. But what we do know is only the believers are called up. And it tells us that over and over again in the scriptures. The believers are called. Jesus will bring us back home to him, as it says in John 14. Jesus promises that all who believe will be saved. Notice it didn't say those who are sinless, those who are worthy, those who are blameless. No, it says those who believe and are baptized, washed clean, will be saved. <clears throat> Baptism is a process. You must believe, confess, repent, baptize, rinse and repeat for the rest of your life. That means then you are engaged with the process. You are committed to the cause of being a true disciple of Christ. We all know someone or many who need to get engaged, who need to be motivated, who need to be revived, who need to be awakened. The revival causes that they had throughout the years was to bring those people out of their comfort zone, bring them back into a real, real relationship with Christ. A relationship that takes them for the rest of their life. That is called a revival. It's to wake the people up who have gone asleep in their faith. It's to bring them back into a real relationship with Christ. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we need to invite them. Better yet, pray to God to move them to participate in the study that we're going to have, the engagement project. Move them to participate in the activities of the family of Christ, the church, to be one in the fellowship in the body. Give us their names. We'll pray for them as well. On our sheets on the back table back in here, we've got a whole section that we pray for every week of people who need to have a spiritual awakening. That's why we put it that way, in those terms. We've been doing this for years. It'll happen in God's time. But see, we've got to pray for them to start with. So we have that list of names we pray over to have an awakening in their spirit, to come home and to come back into a relationship with Jesus. See, the problem is a lot of people say, well, I've been burned by the church, or this person in the church, or that person in the church burned me. They upset me. 
I don't want to go to church anymore. If you're going to a church to have a relationship with that person, you're in the wrong relationship. You go to the church to be in relationship with like-minded believers, and you're there to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're going for the wrong reason. So if you have somebody that you know that needs to be spiritually awakened, give us a list. We won't publish the list if they don't want to be published. So nobody will be offended. But see, the thing about it is, we need to pray them into study. We need to pray them into a right relationship with God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Whew. Dear Lord Jesus, Thank you for this message that you put upon our hearts today. Revive us as we are called to revive others, to bring them into a right relationship with you. Lord, help us to know, grow, and go, and fulfill the great commission that you put on our hearts. Time is short. We never know the time or day. And in your word, it tells us that the Father has not even told you what time or what day this will happen. But we will all be called home. We thank you for this opportunity to have a right relationship, a real relationship with you. To be engaged with you. Committed to you. And to grow, know, and go so that we can do what you have asked us to do. Because that's what we were created to do and who we were created to be. Thank you, Lord God, that you are with us each and every day, every step of the way in our lives. We praise you and thank you for your almighty good works in our lives. Amen. As we prepare to share in this meal that scripture tells us we have to do until Christ's return. The other words from Matthew. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. reading Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body then Matthew records it saying then he took the cup and giving thanks for it he offered it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. scriptures say do so until he returns he's telling us as he always does the rest of the story then you will eat and drink with me
the body of Christ broken for you. Take me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Heavenly Father, until Christ's return, we will continue to share this meal together, to remember what it means, that it is about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his broken body, and his blood shed. But Father, we look forward to the feast that we will eat with you and him when we come into your kingdom. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. of wisdom this morning. And now it is time for prayers for the people. Is there anyone that would like prayer for someone this morning? We've got quite a few on here. Yes. Uh, for my mother, Susan. Susan? Okay. And anything specific? Um, just for strength and protection right now. Praise this morning. Oh, you do? Good. Talked to my daughter yesterday, and uh, uh, she no longer has stage three kidney disease. Oh my gosh! What a blessing. So. Kelly is being healed. Yes. Praise God. Amen. All right. Father God, we come to you today to rejoice in your presence, to cast our cares on the one and only God that can lead us through any storm and guide us through all the trials in this life. You will never leave us or forsake us. And though through all things, help us to be a people of thanksgiving and prayer. Help us to honor you first and foremost, above all things, that you will be here that you will hear our prayers and act upon them. For we need to be your people, as it states in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Help us, Father God, to keep our eyes focused on you, Jesus. As we all know this past week, that the world is crumbling through acts of war against other one another. We cannot change what you have ordained to happen, but we can pray for peace among us that you may hear our words and calm our hearts of those that are involved as to change the outcome and grant peace in our world for a while longer. For if we sit idle and do nothing, Lord God, we are like blades of grass that blow away in the wind. So please hear our prayer, O Lord, and grant us peace to the nations once again. Unite the people in America in brotherly love and not to keep fighting against each other. And as Mark said in his sermon, give America a spiritual awakening, Father God. And uh, Father, we just want to rejoice in the healing of Kelly, of Mark and Lori's daughter, Kelly as she is being healed from her affliction of her kidney disease. Thank you, Jesus, for all things. Father, I pray for Trey's mother, Susan. I pray for strength and protection for her at this time in her life, Lord Jesus. Give her courage and wisdom to know what to do in times of trouble, and give her um, confidence to know that you are walking with her. Father God, we pray today for those that are online and here that are struggling with addictions or upcoming surgeries and medical issues that need your help. They need your help, your, they need your healing power, and I pray the blood of Jesus upon them to wash over them and cleanse them from their addictions and disease. And if they have had surgeries, to heal them quickly by the power of your name, Jesus. We personally thank you for Lori's co-worker, for Mark's uh, sister and brother-in-law, for Carla's cousin Lori, Terry and Diane's daughter Amanda, Diane's mom Ann, Tanya, Larry, Jen, my son Brock, and my grandson Colt. 
We thank you, Jesus, for their lives, and we place them at your feet, Jesus. Let your will be done in there and through it all. Please give them courage, strength, guidance, and the hope that comes through the reading of your word. Let it resonate in their hearts and minds and help them know they are not alone in their sufferings. Comfort their hearts as only you can. Heal their bodies and walk with them in these trials they are facing. <clears throat> and Father God, we pray for our children and grandchildren. In today's world, there are so many paths to destruction and only one narrow path of life everlasting. We pray that they will find you in everything they do. Please give them wisdom to make the right choices in their lives. And if they veer off your path, send someone to them to bring them back into your forgiveness, mercies, and grace, and your loving arms. Help the homeless to be able to find work and housing to help them out in their current situations. Give them hope for each new day. Please be with the workers and the administration offices so that they will do their best to fill out all the correct paperwork in a timely manner so as to help those in need of their assistance. Give them patience, understanding, and love for those seeking their help. And Father, we thank you for your words in the Bible that guide us through this life, as in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 through 11. It says, since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as you also are doing. For we are all God's children, and we thank you, Jesus, for the blessings of knowing you as our personal Savior. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Denise. As we come to this time in our service, uh, we unfortunately have to say goodbye to some of the people online, but I invite you to um, listen carefully to the music and the words that uh, we've chosen for you today and the songs that we've created, curated for you. And uh, we ask that you would take it to heart because it's another form of God's message being delivered to you in a different way. It doesn't all come from me or from Terry standing up in front of you. But in the normal things that we hear and listen to each and every day, we see the works of God being done. And this music is part of that. So I invite you to join with me and take these words of this prayer into your heart today and live it out each and every day. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this day, another day in your presence another day of life. Lord, we thank you for all of the fantastic things, the blessings and the wonders that you do in our life each and every day. Open our eyes to see the wonders of your world that you have blessed us with. Open our ears to hear your word and in song and in word and in message so that we might take it upon us and that we might live it out each and every day. Remove the distractions of this world away from us and so that we can fully concentrate on what you are talking to us on and what you will do for us in our lives. Lord God, we confess today that we are sinners. We are all in need of your grace and mercy. We repent of our sins today. We offer ourselves up humbly to you. We submit our lives to you today, dear. We pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus that we can be redeemed, made whole again into your presence. Come into a full and a right relationship with you. A real and living relationship. That we would be engaged. That we would be 
invigorated that we would go out and spread the word that you've put on our hearts and in our lives to share with others so that they might come into that right relationship with you as well. We thank you for the ministries that you put on our heart to, to bless others with, with Orange Track Racing and the movie ministry and the men's breakfasts and all the other ways to bring people into communion with you, a oneness of purpose and body. Father God, as we bring forth your word today, we just praise you and thank you that you have never abandoned us and we are never alone, that you are in our presence each and every hour of every day, even to the end of the age. When we feel that we are down and depressed and, and being oppressed by society, Lord, lift us up and let us understand that your word triumphs over all of the world. Your love is big enough to surround the world and to change the world, and we need to do our parts to be in communion with you, to be your disciples to the world. Put it upon our hearts today to speak to others in love and in truth. Give us the grace and enable us and embolden us to be available when others need us today, Lord. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen.